without all these people giving their time and, and expertise. So we're very, very grateful for that, uh, that whole crew that have done that. I also want to thank the, uh, the event team. So again, the people with the red badges, um, and in particular the, the team that have been helping you out and directing you around the place and so forth. So uh, Ruby, who's the event manager, and uh, her team, uh, uh, Emily, Molly, Cat and Cat, confusingly, uh, the Cat with a K and Cat with a C. Um, so they've been doing a great job for the last uh, couple of days and will be continuing to do so. So that's very useful indeed. So thank you to you all. Um, just a quick other announcement. So um, uh, Christine did a great job of promoting her book, and I thought I would help with that a little bit more. So uh, she's got a book out, and you should definitely buy a copy. Uh, she didn't bring a whole load of copies to herself for signing, I don't know why, but um, anyway, I'm sure they're available at all good bookstores. Um, uh, that also gives me the opportunity to mention Rick's book. Uh, so Rick has an excellent book out. I've read it on Kindle. Um, and uh, I recommend that. Again, there doesn't seem to be a signing scheduled, so I don't know what happened there, but uh, do buy a copy. If anyone else has a book out at the moment, do let me know and um, we'll, we'll do that. Uh, but I, I admire them for doing it. As, as Christine said, you need a certain amount of perseverance to uh, get these things finished. So um, seeing Rick's face on there makes, me, it, makes it easy for me to uh, move directly on then to, uh, to the debate. Um, so I'm just really literally going to hand over to Rick and he's going to introduce what happens next. All right. Well, it's great to be here, and uh, I'm, I'm very excited to be chairing this, uh, this session. These, these, uh, this kind of a debate is um, something that I've been involved with uh, at the Charleston Conference for a number of years. I've participated in them and uh, chaired several of them. And um, they're always good fun and, and uh, uh, tend to generate more, uh, more light than heat, which is, which is always good in the current environment. Um, so let me very briefly introduce our debaters, and then I'll explain, actually first I'll explain how we're going to do this, and then I'll introduce the debaters. So what we're going to do is, um, I've set up a poll on Slido, um, which uh, you'll be able to go to in a moment. Um, and what we're doing is, we are debating the resolution uh, that Sci-Hub is doing more good than harm to scholarly communication. I'm sure everyone here is... Hand up if you are not familiar with Sci-Hub, in which case I'll explain to you what it is. Okay, that's what I thought. Um, so, uh, what will happen is, uh, first, uh, Daniel Himmelstein will argue in favor of the resolution. He'll make a 10-minute statement. Um, he'll be followed by Justin Spence, who will argue against the revolution with his... Uh, revolution? Against the resolution. <laughs> sure. Uh, 
uh, with his own 10-minute statement. Then Daniel will provide a three-minute response. Uh, Justin will provide a three-minute response. We'll then have some time for Q&A and discussion with the audience, following which we will take the poll again. And the winner of the debate will not be necessarily the person who has the most votes uh, on his side, but the person who has moved the most votes. Um, and there you go. And then uh, that way we'll declare the winner. So um, let's, uh, Roger, let's go to the live poll, which is active. So if you go to uh, sli.do and then enter the code 3591, you will then be able to click through and register your agreement or disagreement with the resolution. So let's do that right now. I think we've got the poll instead of the, oh yeah, I think I may have given you the wrong URL. Is it working? Roger, is it possible to go through to see where we can see the results live? My apologies. I... The, the code is 3591. I enabled Roger to vote rather than enabling Roger to show us the vote results. Can anyone who's voting see the results? Great. All right, 61 to 39. 61 disagree, 39% agree. All right, thank you. Unfortunately, it's only showing percentages. Does anybody have the raw? 99 disagree. Okay, 60 disagree, 40 agree. All right, I'm going to call it at 60 and 40. <laughs> I have lost communication with, oh, there it is. All right, so I will now disable, deactivate the poll and reset the results. And I will now turn the time over. It, it's 60 votes disagree. 40 votes agree. All right, let me quickly introduce our debaters. I'm not going to read you their biographies because you have that in the, in the, uh, in the program. Instead, I'll just tell you that Dan Daniel Himmelstein grew up in Hanover, New Hampshire, which, having lived in New Hampshire, I can tell you is colder than you can possibly imagine. Uh, Justin Spence um, races wooden sailboats off the coast of Cape Cod. That's all you need to know about these debaters. <laughs> Daniel, you're first. Thank you, everyone, uh, for having me here and excited to share my views. Are we re ready to go, Rick? Is Sci-Hub doing more harm than good to scholarly communication? This question boils down to, should science be paywalled? Is open or toll access a better model for communication? While we might never agree on the ethics of Sci-Hub, we can agree that making publicly funded research available to all is a worthy goal. Sci-Hub enables us to reach that goal, but first, how did we get into this predicament? Before the internet, print journals were the best way to distribute articles to academic communities. Since physical distribution has a non-negligible per unit cost, toll access made sense. However, with digital publication, the bandwidth to deliver an article cost a mere fraction of a penny, yet readers encounter paywalls demanding 30 sterling or more. Why? Because we inherited a toll access system from the print publication era. Toll access in today's world is bad for two reasons. First, it deprives access. Second, it leads to exorbitant costs. Scholars publish to add upon the eternal scholarly record. 
How good, however, is a record locked behind paywalls, such that the vast majority of Earth's inhabitants have no access? Do journals fund the research? No. Do journals pay royalties to the authors? No. Do journals pay the peer reviewers who evaluate the quality of submissions? No. Do journals pay the academic editors who manage a process? Usually not. In rare circumstances, journals may provide copy editing. I've never experienced that luxury, however. Then why do journals receive an exclusive right to sell access? The legal answer is that the authors transfer copyright. The social answer is that authors prefer to publish in prestigious journals whose toll access status is not causal but simply vestigial. The ethical answer exists not. The rights to scholarship should be dedicated to society at large. Copyright laws cover original works of authorship, such as prose and composition. Yet when a reader buys access to an article, they pay to access the findings and ideas, which although explicitly outside the realm of copyright, are so entangled by the medium of publication that no alternative route of access exists. As a result, journals pervert copyright to collect revenues on the complete value of a work, primarily its ideas and findings, despite having contributed only slightly to their creation. Consequently, the cost of subscriptions has reached crisis levels. Here's librarian Dana Roth commenting on the situation in 1990. The only solution available to the library in 1981 was to use monograph and binding funds to offset the shortfall in the journal's budget. Libraries were extremely hard hit, and now only after seven years have they recovered just in time for the current crisis. Has the situation improved? Hardly. The Association of Research Libraries estimates inflation-adjusted subscription expenditures tripled from 1986 to 2015. How can libraries bear this financial burden? Until recently, they had little choice. To stand on the shoulders of giants, scholars must first have access. Then Sci-Hub arrived. Scholars no longer depend on institutional access. Librarians may not even be aware that Sci-Hub is a force that freed them from subscriptions. Simply, patrons no longer complain when a journal is excluded from the catalog. It's more convenient to just use Sci-Hub. One look at Spark's Big Deal Cancellation Tracker shows libraries are ditching subscriptions at an accelerating rate. Universities in Germany and Sweden have foregone access to new articles from Elsevier's 2,500 journals. These universities are pursuing read and publish deals, which like Sci-Hub would eventually result in the demise of toll access. However, successful negotiation requires a credible threat of cancellation, which Sci-Hub now affords. Industry insiders are well aware, as a publishing consultant recently expressed to Nature News. Esposito thinks that the German institutes have leverage over Sci-Hub because their researchers can access papers on the illicit sharing site Sci-Hub. We've estimated that Sci-Hub's usage has been growing by 80% a year, measured both by Google search interest and download logs. In 2017, Sci-Hub provided access to half a million PDF downloads, each day that is, 20 times more than the University of Pennsylvania, whose library spent $13 million for their access. Sci-Hub contains 85% of articles published in toll access journals. However, based on which articles have been recently cited in the literature, we estimate Sci-Hub fulfills around 96% of requests. Extrapolating forward, it's clear that subscription publishing is doomed. In the words of Elsevier's vice president, what library will continue to subscribe if a growing proportion of articles is available for free elsewhere? A rare instance where an Elsevier executive agrees with Sci-Hub's creator, who wrote the effective long-term operation of Sci-Hub will be that publishers change their models to support open access because closed access will make no sense. The transition is underway as we speak. At the turn of the millennia, 1% of articles were published in gold OA journals. In 2018, that number reached 13%. While these trends are promising, continuing pressure from Sci-Hub will be crucial to flip existing journals open. But why is open so preferable to closed. Besides the obvious that people benefit from access to knowledge, we must consider the future. Currently, there are more than 4 million new articles published per year. No expert can read every one. Researchers are increasingly turning to text and data mining. A 2018 study found major benefits when mining the 15 million full text compared to abstracts alone. However, widespread open access is essential to enable large corpuses of pre-processed articles. Experts increasingly believe that curing complex diseases will require using artificial intelligence to analyze the wealth of knowledge currently locked in PDFs. Every additional study published without an open license is a lost opportunity to bring us one step closer to a cure. 
In addition, open access is cheaper. A report for the UK's Joint Information Systems Committee found that the per article cost of toll access was 53% higher. This makes sense. Similar to President Trump's border wall, erecting and maintaining paywalls is expensive. Negotiating subscriptions is cumbersome, a waste of human capital. Furthermore, with toll access, authors are removed from the costs and lack incentives to publish in modern journals with efficient workflows. In the words of Dr. Thomas Monroe, paywalls rise costs by allowing authors to externalize these ruinous costs to society, a vast public subsidy, tens of billions of dollars a year. Of the concealment of publicly funded research from the public, SciHub is hastening the end of this grotesque situation. One criticism of open access is that article processing charges burden authors financially. Yet empirically, this hasn't been the case. Less than one third of journals in the directory of open access journals charge fees to authors. They found alternative means of funding. And even when APCs exist, only one in 10 times are they paid for by the authors. According to a 2011 study, which found 59% were paid by funding agencies and the remaining 24% by universities. Finally, most open access journals provide waivers, such that a lack of publication due to financial hardship is rare. Preprints, increasingly adopted with each passing day, also provide authors a zero cost option. Another criticism is that APCs give rise to predatory publishers that take uh, authors' money but do not perform rigorous peer review. However, this is like saying society should have never switched from snail mail to email because spam is bad. In short, like spam, there are easy solutions to predatory journals. There is no easy workaround, however, to the vast majority of scholarship being paywalled. Well, at least that was the case until SciHub. While SciHub is easy to use, creating SciHub was not an easy technical feat. Founded in 2011 by Kazakh graduate student Alexandra Elbakian, SciHub has been able to pirate articles at an unprecedented scale. However, SciHub has no commercial ambition. Instead, they deposit acquired articles to Library Genesis, which bundles them into torrents to be preserved by budding librarians around the globe. Furthermore, SciHub has been invaluable in delivering content to underserved communities. Whether it's medical students in Latin America or scholars in Iran and India, SciHub is succeeding in its self-proclaimed mission to fight in equality and knowledge access across the world. In conclusion, the opportunity offered by a completely open scholarly record is too large to cast aside. While open access advocates have lobbied for such a future for decades, entrenched structures in academia have been slow to change. SciHub is a black swan that will break down paywalls and move publishing towards a model designed for the digital age. Yes, SciHub pushes the boundaries of civil disobedience, but in doing so, it offers the opportunity to liberate scholarly communication. Thank you. With a big step. <laughs> While we're waiting for, the, uh, for the, the queue to start, I'd just like to say a quick good morning and thank you to Rick and Mark for uh, inviting me and in what I hope uh, will continue to be a, a fun and uh, an enjoyable experience. Great. Uh, we've been asked to debate the position that SciHub is doing more good than harm to scholarly communication. I will argue the contrarian view, namely that SciHub is doing significant harm to an already challenged market. Harm that carries long-term negative consequences that far outweigh any so-called benefits that SciHub pretends to provide. SciHub does underscore again the need and demand for improved seamless access to important research. Of course, it's easy to set up a user-friendly cross-platform interface when you steal the content you are hosting and you don't care about who should or should not have access or about issues like version control, archival responsibilities for future generations, and a host of related concerns. At the same time, the publishing industry is already well aware of the need to streamline access to licensed content. Uh, there are several ongoing publisher library initiatives working on improved remote access, widespread open access initiatives, and aid to areas of the world that cannot afford vital research. Publishers have for many years worked with libraries and global NGOs on efforts to make critical information readily available to those in need. The Research for Life initiative is a good example. Cooperative work on RFL provides free or low-cost access to 90,000 leading journals and books to thousands of institutions from 120 low- and middle-income countries around the world. Conversely, a recent Science Magazine analysis suggests that of the millions of documents downloaded via SciHub, very little is used by those truly in need. In fact, most SciHub use originates from well-established and primarily well-funded locations in the Western world. 
My point is not to suggest the current system is flawless or to assign altruistic motives to efforts to improve same. Rather, I'd simply point out that the market was already speaking loudly and publishers are applying signif significant efforts in response. On the other side of the equation, Sci-Hub is doing significant damage with both short and long-term implications for libraries, institutions, publishers, researchers, and end users in general. Most troubling, Sci-Hub muddies the landscape by recklessly creating a false perception that is not sustainable. The perception that the creation and dissemination of high-quality peer-reviewed research carries no appreciable cost and that there is no harm in utilizing pirated content. Indeed, Sci-Hub is training researchers, particularly young researchers, to expect that high-quality scholarly information is essentially free. Even more worrisome, evidence suggests that some libraries, particularly in Europe, are beginning to use the availability of pirate sites as leverage in negotiations. Sci-Hub is putting forth an academically indefensible argument, but also causing behavioral shifts that will undoubtedly cause great harm to scholarly communication as a whole, not simply the publishers that Alexandra, Alexandra El Bakian uh, claims to find so repugnant. El Bakian seems to suggest this illegal behavior is justified because she serves as some sort of modern day Robin Hood singularly focused on the goal of ensuring that scholarly information is made more widely accessible. Asking us to believe she is tireless, tirelessly working to achieve some sort of altruistic goal. I confess, I am a clear cynic on this point. I think there is much more in play, although that's a subject for a longer discussion. And it's important to note that the field of scholarly communication is not unique. There are similar debates regarding profit margins and operations in the fields of education, healthcare, utilities, to name a few. Such debates can and should be constructive, but no one can seriously argue that those industries don't carry legitimate costs and without some source of funding would simply cease to exist. Accordingly, the motives behind Sci-Hub, in my view, are irrelevant. Theft is ethically indefensible and cannot be seen as a viable solution to perceived market inequities. I may think the healthcare industry, particularly in the US, is a public good industry that is significantly flawed. I do. However, under no circumstances does that justify my walking into my local pharmacy and simply stealing whatever prescription drugs I may want or need. It's also academically dishonest to suggest simply making things free as any sort of real long-term solution. The world of scholarly communication is complex and solutions to challenges are not always easy or fast. Perhaps there is no better illustration of this point than the recent financial performance of the Public Library of Science. PLOS is an important effort with good intentions. It's also an effort that enjoys a not insignificant allocation of public monies. And yet, yet despite that significant benefit, PLOS has struggled both financially and in terms of developing and maintaining a long-term manuscript flow. There are important things to learn from the PLOS initiative, not the least of which that there are no magic bullets. I think it's also valid to ask why scholarly research community is not flooding PLOS with vast amounts of the very best and highest caliber research. Probably because the dynamics of scholarly communication are complex and not simply a reflection of a universal altruistic desire to make all information freely accessible to anyone who has an interest. Despite all this, Sci-Hub continues to foolishly encourage a false and unreasonable set of expectations for a new generation of consumers. Long-term economics cannot support a system forced to endure such wide-scale theft and negative shifts in behavioral norms. And continuing on this path will produce negative outcomes for all. The more immediate short-term damages caused by Sci-Hub are no less concerning. Sci-Hub represents a clear risk to the security of personal information. There is ample evidence demonstrating that Sci-Hub employs phishing, hacking, alterations of personal profiles, and password theft theft to illegally acquire content. This reckless violation of system security adds significant risk to all areas parts of the research chain. And it's not clear that the security breaches are limited to stealing content. Joe DeMarco, a former U assistant U.S. attorney for the Southern District of Manhattan and a noted expert in cybercrime stated at a recent SSP conference, quote, I have never once met a cyber criminal who set out to gain access to a database for one purpose and only confine themselves to that one purpose once they got inside the database. It's not how criminals think, unquote. Indeed, Rick Anderson wrote in a recent Scholarly Kitchen article about the dangers of security surrounding network credentials and the risk of unapproved access to email 
academic information and grades, personal financial information, department budgets, hiring information, and personnel records. Security concerns surrounding HIPAA and their ilk also drive up all costs and to all facets of the industry. Combating wide-scale theft involves significant technical and staffing expense for publishers, institutions, and libraries alike. My company works with libraries and publishers to help stop attacks and thefts of content. Over and over again, we've seen instances where IT systems are slowed and or incapacitated. Access to electronic resources is compromised for all. Staffs are required to divert work towards time-consuming and urgent analysis, and security of all sites must be reset. Demands for related improvements to hardware and alternative access mechanisms are similarly expensive. SciHub also corrupts usage reporting, even for open access content, compromising efforts to determine, import, determine important readership patterns and further clouding efforts to pursue different economic models and the value of same. And finally, the impact on the smaller contributors of the world of scholarly communication is real. There are some popular big players that tend to get much of the bl blame for the perceived woes of the market, publishers such as Elsevier, Wiley, Springer, etc. I'm not going to get into that aspect of the discussion, but for those that subscribe to this belief, it's worth noting that if SciHub Sci undermines revenue generation and drives up costs for all, common sense suggests that it will be the small publishers and societies that feel the brunt of things far sooner and to a far greater degree than the larger endeavors in the industry. Time precludes my expanding further, so I'll close with a final thought. Reasonably priced, ready access to important research that saves and improves lives is important. I think on that we can all agree. Unfortunately, some want to take that to an extreme, thereby suggesting that anything that moves us towards that end should be universally acceptable. In other words, the ends justifies the means. To that, I'd respond with a quote from Nick Harkaway, author of The Blind Giant, Being Human in a Digital World, who says, quote, and don't tell me the end justifies the means because it doesn't. We never, we never reach the end. All we ever get is the means. That's what we live with, unquote. Sci-Hub, in my view, is nothing more than large-scale theft. As a means, it is neither sustainable nor defendable. In my view, it's also not something we should live with. Thank you. Do the ends justify the means? Sci-Hub is a spectacular example of yes. We've inherited a broken system that harms every stakeholder besides publishers. Scholars, libraries, and society suffer. By placing research behind paywalls, we squander the potential of public and philanthropic investments. A better system of widespread open access is just around the corner, thanks to Sci-Hub the disruptor. The best and cheapest solution to piracy is open access, where an open license enables anyone, including SciHub, to redistribute articles. Hence, SciHub obsoletes itself. You may find SciHub repugnant, but appreciated, I ask, as a stepping stone to an open future. As the over 12,000 quality free-to-read journals already in existence demonstrate, open access is a viable business model. All of us at R2R have the power to recognize a turning tide and proactively support open models. The opposing gentleman claims SciHub is theft, but PDFs, unlike physical items, can be copied without depleting the original. Therefore, SciHub is unlike pilfering a pharmacy. With education or utilities, paywalls fund the creation of the commodity, but not so with scholarly communications where authors, reviewers, and editors create value without remuneration. The gentleman portrays SciHub as motivated by criminal impulse, but what sort of criminal gives away all their loot? Shall we be as delusional as Inspector Javert, or should we accept the ethical reality of the current dilemma? The true theft is toll access, where authors, funders, and universities are compelled to forfeit ownership of their work to publishers, who have perverted the original intent of copyright to become gatekeepers of ideas destined for public consumption. The gentleman claims SciHub directly hacks ac academics, but without public evidence to verify this claim, it's merely a smear. To the contrary, Albakian has stated SciHub is not fishing by itself. According to HaveIBeenPwned.com, my information has been hacked at least 12 times. However, these intrusions occur regardless of SciHub, which leverages but does not cause the poor security practices of scholars. The gentleman claims SciHub creates an unreasonable expectation that scholarship can be free. I say fantastic, let it be free. What does SciHub mean? 
Sci-Hub means access to the existing 70 million articles locked behind paywalls. This access is currently serves populations most deprived by the current system. Portugal, Iran, Tunisia, Greece, Chile, and 50 other countries, many underdeveloped, rank above the U.S. and U.K. in terms of Sci-Hub downloads per capita. Sci-Hub also means a future of open access and reuse, where a cancer patient doesn't have to resort to piracy to learn about their disease, where large-scale text mining can uncover 21st century cures, where permissionless invent innovation will unleash a Cambrian explosion in scholarly communication. Dislike Sci-Hub as you must, but do remember that it was Sci-Hub that ushered in widespread adoption of open access, the greatest advance in scholarly communication since the inception of journals over 350 years ago. I love being in England in a debate. I never get called a gentleman, certainly not on stage. So. <laughs> um, I don't believe the question of whether Sci-Hub is doing more harm than good boils down to whether science should be paywalled or open access is a better model. Uh, the real question to me is, are we comfortable allowing a shadowy group operating on the dark web to dictate policy? A group headed by a person who openly flaunts established law refuses to be transparent about her funding sources and dismisses concerns over hacking and security by saying that she doesn't think passwords are used for more nefarious reasons and that as a rule they are not. Meanwhile, a recent Sci-Hub attack on a UK university consisted of a 48-hour dictionary attack in order to secure six passwords. Those proxy passwords were then used to attack 150 different, uh, 350 different publisher websites and request more than 45,000 PDF downloads. My company has worked on a number of projects for the STM to block an Iranian password site that was openly supplying compromised credentials to well over 100 libraries around the world. The viral nature of groups using stolen documents is sobering. And those who supposedly donate their credentials should consider that more often than not, they will find them on past sites like PathFans, which trades passwords for other illicit services. On the dark web, a set of credentials can fetch up to $75. For an industry that has spent so much time, effort, and money on important issues like DOIs, Crossref, and archival safeguards, it's amazing that some librarians are now suggesting that patrons use Sci-Hub. It's almost as if we have gone from a careful future-facing approach to charting the future of electronic scholarly communication to an approach more akin to a wild weekend in Las Vegas. Safety and ethics aside, I also don't see any evidence to suggest that Sci-Hub has had any positive impact on the growth of open access. Open access started in 2002 or 2003 in Budapest, Bethesda, and Berlin. Sci-Hub, on the other hand, did not start stealing content until 2011. It's not Sci-Hub that will bring about productive change in open access. Rather, it is a total revamping of the scholarly reward system that Mark Schultz mentioned at the very end of his keynote talk yesterday. I confess I was hoping that this important issue would have received more than a cursory mention given its obvious importance. Yes, journal prices have increased significantly over the past 30 years, an issue that rightly demands careful attention. But again, it's important to note that there are other areas of public good that are equally problematic, such as housing, education, healthcare, insurance, and a host of similar industries important to public welfare. College Board's 2017 Trends in College Pricing in the U.S. reports that the average tuition at a private nonprofit four-year institution in the U.S. went from 15,160 in 1998 to 34,740 in 2018, an increase of 129%. Of course, that does not include room and board, which also had increased precipitously. Ah, thank you, Rick. All right, I'm going to cut off then. Thanks. <laughs> All right. All right, we now have, my mic is working, right? We now have time for, uh, for discussion. I think we have 15 or 20 minutes before we'll retake the poll. And we have some roving mics. Uh, so anybody who would like to make a comment or ask a question of one or both of our debaters, please raise your hand. And Anthony, surprisingly, is the first one. <laughs> Anthony Watkinson, Cyber Research. And I've just been looking at your CV, Daniel. I'm sorry to see you've lost your moustache. Do you have a moustache in your picture on your site? 
Yeah. Uh, the audio quality is. Say Sorry, that again. you've lost your moustache from oh, your. No moustache. Yes, no. I used See, to. that sort of thing worries me about somebody. <laughs> <laughs> but anyhow, um, just one point. Your, I enjoyed very much your presentation. Journals do pay editors. All the Elsevier journals pay their editors. All the big um, societies, all the societies pay their editors. Virtually all the societies. All the publishers do in your field, yeah. I just got invited to be a publisher. Yeah. Yeah. Or, I'm sorry, a, a editor a couple of days ago. I don't think I'll be getting paid. What Should sort I of what journal payment? was it? What journal? Um, you got remember scientific <laughs> data, I think. Oh, well, it probably the, the new journal. journal. Is it, is it, is it an open group? access journal? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. A, a but managing they, editor and an editorial board member. No, no, a, a guest editor for a specific oh, oh, article. Yeah, okay. Oh, okay. Oh, for an article? Yes. yes. Yeah. yeah, okay. That's to, but they do, I can tell you definitely, publishers here pay their editors sometimes a very large sum of money indeed. I was talking, somebody told me 100,000 the other day, uh, pounds. But I know it's been quite high. I've had paid 40,000 pounds to an editor 10 years ago. Okay? But I'll tell you more later if you like. There is evidence for this. Okay. <laughs> So uh, definitely some of the people doing the, the important selection work are paid, but I think you know, many, many of the people boards, no. doing but the creation work are not The point paid. is there are larger costs than you make out. I and mean, it doesn't matter, not against open access or anything. No, but there are larger costs. Uh, this, uh, was Toby, I don't have my glasses on, so I can't see. Hello, and then I'm Kat. Philip Nye. And um, I'm a trader, I'm a bookseller and agent, subscription agent, and I'm one of the last ones still around from the old ASA times. Um, yes, we do exist still. So I'm a bit biased, obviously, because I'm part of the information infrastructure. But apart from that, I wanted to touch some of the basics, um, which SciHub is one of the phenomenons. And we've talked about open access and how do readers get the material. At one point, I think that the societies of the universities created journals and created this kind of trade of information to research. And it was in the hands of the scholarly organizations worldwide to do this. They somehow managed not to keep it amongst themselves, but needed other parties to help them. That's, I guess, how academic publishing came into place in free enterprise space and apart from the university systems. And um, I wanted to touch a little bit about the ethics and the realism between free enterprise interests on the one side and idealism on the other side. Not everything which is captured in an idealistic way is actually functioning in real life. And that's what we see a lot of times with government systems, with political systems, and here we are in a danger because we are always talking about a global system for open access when 48 to 75 percent of the world is not part of this global system. I'm talking not about the people who don't have the funding, but the people who would have the funding but are abusing these efforts of barrier-free, um, paywall-free um, um, access to information. As long as we are in Europe trying to create an open access world, putting everything on these platforms, but three quarters of the world is not participating in that. It's dangerous. I don't know what the interests are of some parts of the world. I can't say. I can only say if the idealism says we should have no more walls, we should be openly researching globally, we need to have that global world at the same time. And as long as that's not happening, it's very, very dangerous to experiment too far out there with not knowing what's going to happen. Because we could get cut out at the end of the day, and with all this research happening, being funded by tax monies and by governments, others might participate who are not participating, and I'm a bit afraid of that. And the infrastructure, in the meantime, will have been destroyed, the old infrastructure of the old world of doing business, and there is going to be nothing left for us to pick up the pieces, and that is something we should at least think about in this process, and not make it a matter of belief, but a matter of factual decision making. That much. Thank you. No? Okay. Uh, Mark, and then we have another hand back there. 
Thank you, Mark Harden. Um, a question really for Daniel, but Justin could, could comment as well. Um, you talk about um, uh, copying a PDF is not theft because you're not removing an actual um, piece of real property and it's just a, making a copy. Um, do you feel the same way about other examples where people are taking a free ride on other people's, uh, uh, I guess, intellectual property or, or free property, for example, pirating Hollywood movies? Do you feel that plagiarism is okay because it's not actually taking anyone's property away? Do you feel sneaking into the Artois conference uh, for free is kind of okay because it doesn't cost me anything? I mean, do you, do you extend that to all kinds of things or do you think scholarly publishing is a special case? I think scholarly publishing is a special case. I, I may think that the other things are okay, but I, I won't disclose that here. <laughs> I, I think the big thing differentiating, say, uh, journal articles with other types of creative works like movies is that the paywalls for movies or, or most types of literature directly fund the creation. And I think that's an important factor. You know, was the work created to, to sell access to that work? Is that the funding model of creating the work? And with scholarly publication, it usually is not. Uh, where the model to create the work is that the public is funding it and the scholars want it to be open to disseminate their ideas most effectively. So I think that's kind of the, the biggest distinguishing factor. I think for me, the, the, um, the, there isn't a distinguishing factor between those issues. I think um, if you believe that a system is flawed uh, and, and requires uh, significant change, there are a number of routes that, that you should go through as an individual and as a community to explore change and, and pursue those, as I would argue is currently happening in the publishing world. You know, keep in mind the electronic world of publishing is relatively new compared to the decades and well, centuries of, of print publishing. Um, and it's a complex industry. Um, it, 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 I think it's unreasonable to expect that we're going to turn the switch and, and have it um, uh, fundamentally different than it's been for a long, long time. Um, and there are infrastructure structures and, uh, and also brands that are involved. Harvard University um, enjoys fantastic brand recognition around the world for good reason, but that didn't start yesterday. That started over decades of, uh, of, of work. Same is true for the New England Journal of Medicine. Why does an author want to publish in the New England Journal of Medicine? Right? Because they want to get exposure, they want to get credit, they want to get recognition. All for perfectly viable uh, reasons. But again, talking about the issue of scientific reward, until everybody's on the playing field saying everything should be free, including the work I do, and it doesn't matter where it gets published as long as it's out there, if we move to that world, then we'll be great. Um, it'll be a lot, lot easier, but we're not in that world, and so I, I don't think there's a distinction. So we have a mic uh, right over there, and then Kent. Hello, uh, Jennifer Smith. St. George's University of London. Um, I'd just like to say I came to this conference a couple of years ago and I thought this one looked like it's going to be a good one. Plenty of controversial things going on. Um, I said the comment then at the time that the profits that a lot of the big publishers are making, I mean, fair profit seems okay, but if you have a look at El Sevier's profit that were just announced a few days ago, it's there on the internet, you can see how much it is for yourself, is that um, a fair amount of money? When you think of people uh, doing fun runs for charity, cancer charities, things like that, raising money, do they think the money that they're raising is going into uh, shareholders' pockets? No, they think they're going to the research, it's going to the research. So, uh, yeah, uh, when you say who, it's theft, it's who's thieving off of who, I would say. Uh, so that's my controversial comment, thank you. <laughs> Kent? Um, yeah. You okay, Rick? You want me to go? Please, yeah. Okay. Um, so it's, it strikes me that the idealism around free scientific content has actually made uh, institutions soft targets in the parlance of hackers. Um, this has been an ongoing initiative for 20 or 30 years by all sorts of nefarious players on the web to find ways into the networks that we now depend on. Um, if you read anything that has been written since 2015, you know how long-term this has been. So I guess I want to 
ask Daniel especially, how do you maintain the idealism while also hardening the targets so that identity, passwords, records, uh, accounts aren't hacked like they're being hacked now? How do you reconcile a, a site that is basically piggybacked by uh, Russian hack farms um, and stealing content and then using that as a Trojan horse to steal other things? How do you reconcile that with the fact that we need a future where we need to harden against these things? So I, I think I view Sci-Hub as a very temporary thing that once all journals are open access, loses its relevance and will need to hack no more articles. And whether it's good or bad for scholarly communications, I think, is a little bit different of a question than, you know, how is it for digital security? Uh, but, you know, se computer security is always a sort of arms race. And because of hackers, which, of which Sci-Hub is just, you know, one of many, um, universities are adopting better security practice. So, for example, at University of Pennsylvania, we now need to use two-factor authentication to log in. Um, this actually does um, apply to the, this topic, though, because as university access gets more difficult, so for example, if I have to pull out my phone to now access a paper on my computer, I'm more likely to directly go to Sci-Hub. So while um, you know, uh, increasing security prevents piracy, it also makes more end users for convenience. If, if I could jump in just as a quick yeah, please. Yeah. Um, I, I think for me the concern is that, uh, that security is an arms race um, uh, and anybody who's involved with budgets of organizations will realize what uh, an extraordinarily high cost that is and that cost is not going to come down. Um, and so there are real risks associated with the Sci-Hub. And, and to the question of you know, when everything switches to open access, um, uh, Sci-Hub will become irrelevant. You know, I'm reminded of in 1998 when, when electronic publishing was really pushed into the market as a viable option for library access. Everybody talked about with the demise of print. Well, that tale has been very long. There's still a fairly significant amount of print um, uh, particularly in, in less uh, affluent parts of the world, um, it's still there. I think the, the chances of the industry going full open access, uh, no paywalls whatsoever um, in the relative short term to make Sci-Hub um, um, uh, irrelevant is, is, is probably wishful thinking. It's going to be a longer process than that, um, in part because it's not just the publishers that have to change, but it's all facets that have to change, including the researchers and the decision on where to publish, why to publish, and, 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 and the like. So I think David at the back was the David next. Thanks. Uh, David Thieu, Commercial Director of Maverick. Um, I'm interested to get a sense from the panel of where they think the funders stand on all of this. Without the funders, none of this is possible. Um, does Daniel, for example, really believe that the funders feel happy um, that piracy and theft are good for their brand? Fun funders specifically, do they feel that Sci-Hub is, is good for their brand? Is that the question, David? Piracy and theft. Piracy and theft, okay. I don't think that piracy and theft to Sci-Hub is associated with the brand of funders. Uh, I think funders just want their research to be accessible. I, I think the question of, of, uh, of funding in terms of, of where information is, is, is published and whether it's associated with, uh, with, with breaking the law. I mean, there's been certain court decisions uh, demonstrating that, that Sci-Hub has clearly broken the law is a bad thing, and I think most would not want to be associated with it. And I think the question of funding can also be flipped on its side, getting to the point that Kent had made. Um, who, who is funding um, Sci-Hub? Um, Ms. Elbach, Bakian won't answer that question. Um, and if you think about the server farms they must have to acquire the content, maintain the content, and manage the incredible flow of, of demand for information, um, I think it's a viable question. Um, where, where is that funding coming from? Because again, it implies that, it, that, that research can be free. Somebody's paying the boat for her, and I'd, I'd be really interested to know who that is. If I can comment quickly, the Sci-Hub webpage 
has donation links, so you can uh, donate in Bitcoin. And we actually looked at all the donations they've received, a, a few hundred thousand um, US dollar equivalent of Bitcoin. And so uh, a lot of funding probably comes from donations and people who have been given access and want to contribute back. I think, in all due respect, I would be concerned about an industry that is funded by Bitcoin. Bitcoin is an interesting initiative. Um, and is in its early stages and will have an interesting future. Uh, but not all of Bitcoin is, uh, is, is uh, clear and, um, um, and, and transparent. So I think Katrina was next and then... Thank you. Um, uh, I'd like to agree with Justin. I think um, no one who's been in the open access... Could, could you put the mic a little closer? Oh, no one who's been yes. in the open access uh, debate for any length of time has ever argued it's free. And in fact, I think the cost is increasing as the infrastructure and technology um, support um, is, is, uh, also needs financing, which, which is a big hole. I, um, I also think that transparency is absolutely fundamental. Um, but that also applies to the publishing industry. Mm -hmm. And where we don't have price transparency and where there are non-disclosure deals, I think you know, it is as lacks the same sort of transparency you're arguing against SciHub. And I also agree that fundamentally the entire problem rests on the reward system. And that is the greatest barrier. And while there are no incentives for any of the key actors to change, whether they're researchers or institutions or publishers, because they have a vested interest within the system that actually supports either their revenue stream or their reputation, um, to the extent that I think researchers don't even realize they're trapped within that system, um, then we've, we have to find ways to disrupt it. And so I, I have two questions is, when does change become slow enough that disruption is justified? And at that point, do actors like SciHub, regardless of whether they're, well, they are illegal, uh, become justifiable in the fact that we're even having this debate and, and helping to, uh, to have that disruption. And uh, Jean-Claude Jean uh, Guedin, um, who was leading the expert group on scholarly, uh, future scholarly publishing for the EU, um, um, makes the point that the only uh, actor in the system who is outside this sort of Russian doll, this nested ranking system, I don't think he uses that term in, in, in the actual report, are the funders um, because they are themselves not ranked. Um, and as they, if they're able to, to get together, they can also aggregate and have the power and influence. And that's why Plan S is so upsetting to everyone because it's so disruptive. But things like Plan S and SciHub, I, I think, are symptoms of immense frustration by the fact that people can see the potential benefits of not just open access, it's just the tip of the iceberg, but it's open science, and why things aren't changing fast enough. And in that regard, I think SciHub is an important landmark. Um, and how else are we going to speed up the rate of change that's required in scholarly publishing? I think we can respond very quickly, and then we need to uh, then we need to redo. I, I would just very quickly respond that um, um, to underscore again that I am not suggesting that the the industry as a whole is is fine as is, and and all I'm saying is that that SciHub as a response to concerns about the industry, um, in my view, is 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 very problematic. Um, and and I guess just shortly, I, I agree with you that that when change is slow. Um, 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 then, then kind of you sometimes have an opposite reaction. Um, I, I think there's actually been a fairly significant amount of change. It hasn't been as fast as some want, um, but if publishers were just digging in and saying, no, we'll never do open access, then, then, then I could understand that. But again, when you look at, it's not just the publishing uh, arm of it, but it's also the reward system and all facets of the system need to change. It's complex. It's a pretty big ship and that, those sorts of ships tend to, 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 to to turn slowly, and I don't think putting a mine in front of that ship, which I view SciHub as being, is, is responsible. But, you know. <laughs> I, yeah, I want to clarify that I don't think publishing has no cost to do. With open access, that cost is still paid, just in a different way. Um, I think the question brings up the point that 
open science is much bigger than open access, and once we get open access, there's still a lot of work to do to make science more open. However, I think that work becomes easier in a few ways. When journals don't have to focus on paywalls, they can focus on other tasks like making the articles and the history behind them more reproducible. And when authors have to directly pay APCs or you know have to use their grants to pay it, it makes them ha have more competitive, or competitive pressure to choose a journal that's providing the best services for the cost, which I think can break some of these, um, the stagnation in the innovation in the market. All right, and with that, uh, we need to now uh, close the, uh, the conversation and retake the poll. So if everybody would return to uh, sli.do, enter code 3591, <laughs> you don't have a Russian. and oh, record okay. your, <laughs> and now I can see the results, so, oh, perfect. Get out and vote, it's a close one. <laughs> yeah, really, come on, people. Every, every vote counts. <laughs> so I see that's another swing voter. <laughs> that's right, absolutely. <laughs> I don't know, Daniel, it's looking like you've done, uh, you've done the job. Wow. Oh, oh. <laughs> this is actually quite exciting. <laughs> is anyone still trying to vote? Hand up if you're still trying to vote. We still have one. Can, can I make a plea to those that are still <laughs> trying to vote? So. <laughs> All right, it looks like, oh. <laughs> All right, by the percentages, we have now 56% disagreeing. 50. All right, I'm going to close the poll. 55% disagreeing and 45% agreeing. I think that means you are the man. Making Daniel the winner. <laughs> Join me in congratulating him. Right, so I just want to thank everyone, especially uh, Daniel and Justin, for their participation. Thank you to you for your participation in the conversation. I think this has been uh, a very enjoyable and interesting uh, program. Also want to thank the sponsors of this session, RSC and Carger, and, um, and remind everybody to please, please fill out your surveys. Uh, the yellow, the bright yellow uh, paper in your packet um, as a member of the advisory board, I can tell you that these surveys are tremendously important in helping us uh, shape the program for the following year. Uh, and with that, I'll send everybody to your workshops, and Daniel and I will scamper to try to get to ours ahead of our attendees. <laughs> Thanks, Daniel. That was fun. That was, that was, that was really great. great. That was yeah, great. Thanks, Rick. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks that was fun. Here.